Good evening, everyone. Not too loud? It's good? Okay. All right, Sunday night. We're in First Chronicles, and we're going to be in chapter 10 tonight. And before we do that, we are going to go before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the awesome word that you provide for us, Lord, for instruction, Lord, for reproof, Lord, for um, just godly wisdom, Lord, for um, just, uh, just uh, proper instruction, Lord, for us to navigate um, our Christian walks and maybe those of us or those who can hear, Lord, who maybe they aren't walking with the Lord that it would just inspire you to, to see the, just the awesome wisdom that comes from this book, Lord, that you wrote for us, Lord, to um, just to show us the way, Lord. Um, like your word says, you are the truth, the life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And, um, and this word, Lord, shows us the way, this word that you have given us. And we thank you, Lord, for the things you're doing um, and I pray, Lord, for all those right now who um, are listening, um, all those who are sick, Lord, who are in need of healing, that you would just have your hand upon them. And just pray, Lord, tonight that um, that your word would go out and that it would be um, exactly the words that, uh, that you need to speak to each one of us, Lord. So we thank you, we praise you, and we just um, pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So 1 Chronicles chapter 10, we've been going through um, 1 Chronicles, and the Chronicles to this point have been a bit of a, of a kind of a record to kind of set the record straight for um, the Israelites that were going back into the land after the 70 years of captivity. Now, we talked about this before, that this book was probably written by Ezra, um, that Ezra was the first one that left from the Babylonian captivity. He got permission to go with uh, some of his um, countrymen back to the, uh, the nation of Israel, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Um, and now they're going back after now the Babylonians were were subsequently conquered um, after um, a, a time in Babylon, um, the Babylonians were overtaken by the Medo-Persians, um, and the Medo-Persians came in and were actually sympathetic to the, the, the needs and the, and the wants of, of the, the people of Israel who had been taken into captivity. And so Ezra is the first one to go back and when Ezra goes back, he feels compelled by the Lord to, to go through this, this genealogy and chronicle this genealogy for all the families that were going back so that everybody knew where everybody was to fit and where everybody was to go, you know, as far as their families were concerned, back to the land where, where they were. And so at the end of chapter 9 and getting into chapter 10, we, we're, we're kind of getting to the culmination of all of the, 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 numer you know, the, the genealogies of names and, and all of the, the names that I'm sure we mispronounced many of. Um, but the record is there. And at this point, uh, actually in the last couple of chapters, it started to steer us to the genealogies in particular of the tribe of Judah. And as we spoke about at the beginning of getting into this book, that, that this was a, a chronicle of the genealogies, but it was specifically targeting or focusing upon the, the tribe of Judah, which we know that the tribe of Judah was the tribe that would ultimately bring uh, David, the king, who was a predecessor of Jesus, our king the Messiah who would come through that Davidic line. So as we see at the beginning of chapter 10, 
it begins to delve into, now it's not just the genealogies, but now it's, it's some of the accounts of what happened. And interestingly enough, we pick up at a point, um, it's kind of funny, I was thinking about, it, this would be kind of like, somebody tells you, hey, this is a really good movie, you should watch it, but you got to start watching it like, you know, a third, in, a third of the way into the movie because <laughs> the beginning of chapter 10 just, just kind of jumps in to a, a certain chain of events that would lead us to, um, that would ultimately lead us to where David comes into the picture. And so tonight we're going to be focusing on um, an individual that if it weren't for him, um, the coming of David would have been very different and maybe not as impactful. And so tonight, as we get into the, to chapter 10, we're going to look at the life of King Saul. Now, King Saul is a, somebody who, I think he's kind of the biblical poster child for somebody who, who started out great, he had a lot of potential, and then kind of didn't, didn't make it to the finish line. And, and there's good reason for that. And as we get into chapter 10, it's going to actually tell us why. But as we begin in chapter 10, it starts off here um, that it's definitely a, a transition, um, but it's also um, kind of the last key detail in our understanding of the establishment of the Hebrew kingdom. And so now we get into this, uh, like I say, it's like, okay, you put the disc in and, and it's, you know, a third of the way into the movie. So it jumps right in after, at the end of chapter, um, chapter 9, it's, you know, it's, it's ending with some of the genealogies and it, it ends, and then it jumps right in at the beginning of chapter 10, verse 1. It says, now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Okay, hold off for just a second. There's a lot that just happened in that sentence so Israel fled from the Philistines these are God's people these are, these are God's people that God made a covenant with yet they're running away from the Philistines the Philistines were their enemy they were running scared that doesn't seem to add up and we're going to find out why so it says that the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Now the Philistines are an interesting, we, we've heard the name and we, we've, we've heard that terminology. We know that Goliath was a Philistine. Um, he's somebody who's um, a, a person of note, maybe a villain of note in, uh, in the, uh, um, the life of David for sure, but also in the life of Saul. But the enemy of the Israelites were the Philistines. Now the Philistines were a transplant. They were actually seafaring people that came from another place and they found uh, you know, a place to settle there. And they were, they were already coming into the land when the Israelites were coming into the promised land. And as the Israelites were coming in, they weren't in great number, but they started to become more numerous, and they started to inhabit a certain part of the land that was very close to the land that we know now as Israel. And the Philistines, because they were seafaring people, they, they traded with a lot of lands that were far away. And they were fortunate enough to get a hold of a, a very high-tech um, uh, weaponry at that time, which was called iron. They were able to utilize iron, and they were able to uh, make weapons, you know, spears, uh, spear points, swords, uh, all, the, all the implements of war, you know, uh, co uh, coats of, of chain mail, 
probably helmets. The metals that were being used prior to that were probably inferior. Uh, the, the, the metal or the steel that they were using allowed them really to be more powerful. And so it's not surprising that they were, the Philistines were fighting against Israel and they were, geographically, they, were, they had gone way into the land of Israel. So they had, they had made a pretty advanced um, attack on the nation. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the, the Israelites were, were running away. They were probably afraid because they knew that their enemy, they may have been in greater number. It doesn't say that here, but there, if you read, uh, there's other accounts in, I believe it's in 1 Samuel, of what happened. But they were running scared maybe because they knew that these guys had better weapons or maybe they were scared because they didn't expect an attack that was so far into their land but they were running scared nonetheless and so verse 2 says then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab and Malchishua, Saul's sons So there was a lot that, that just happened in these two verses. In order to under, really understand what happened, there's some things that we need to kind of delve into. The Philistines became a main rival and kind of a thorn in the side of God's people. Um, and as I said before, the Philistine army had attacked deep into Israeli territory. And now they're at Mount Galboa. So if you turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 28, we're going to read a little bit more into what happened here. So in 1 Samuel chapter 28 begins, now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. Now, a little background here. David had been pursued hard, har you know, harshly pursued by Saul, this very Saul that we're, that we're looking at. Saul was, he really had it in for David. And that's a whole other Bible study. But suffice it to, to say that David fled from Saul because he didn't want to be, he, did, he had, an, there was an opportunity where David could have taken Saul out and he didn't because Saul was God's anointed. And so David, in order to remove himself from the, the situation as it was playing out, he went to Philistine territory. In a way, it seems like he was kind of cavorting with the enemy. And there was a certain point in time, and this account describes it, where the Philistines thought David was one of theirs. And so David was being asked if he was going to go out to battle with them. Now, this is the very battle that they were going to go out to fight King Saul. If David had malicious intent and was really, really wanted to get Saul... He would have said, oh yeah, I'm in. I'm going. I'm going with you. Let's get this guy. Instead, he says, verse 2, And David said to Achish, Surely you know that your ser what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now Samuel had died. Now Samuel the prophet had died. And all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city, and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. So just kind of to give you a, a kind of a snapshot of what's happening, the Philistines, had they knew what was going on, 
there was some strife going on. Uh, Saul was going after David. They knew David was strong. Um, and David actually, they were trying to get David to come fight for them. So David had kind of a congenial relationship, even though they were technically the enemy. But David was running from Saul, trying to stay away from Saul because Saul was trying to get him. Now Saul has more on his plate than he probably can handle. And so David is, is there. And the side note there is that Samuel, the prophet, has died. And so the enemies are thinking, okay, well, the prophet who was giving them you know, guidance and, and leadership from the Lord is now out of the picture. So the enemies are kind of like the sharks, and now the blood is in the water. And so they're getting ready to attack. And so we see, uh, as the events unfold here, verse 4, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Now, if you look up fear in the, in the Bible, in the Word, there's a lot of verses that deal with fear. And fear is definitely not a characteristic that God gives us or that we derive from the Lord. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear. We know that. And so Saul is afraid. So at this point, you think, okay, he's afraid. So what is he going to do? And this is a question, I think, for all of us. We're all human. We all have fears. We all have things that, that we are concerned about. And we, we get to that point where we say, okay, what am I going to do? Are we going to try and fix things ourselves? Do things ourselves? Um, take matters into our own hands? You know, all of those uh, cliche, you know, pull ourselves up from our bootstraps kind of thing. Or, where are we going to put our faith and trust? And so we see what happens here when Saul is greatly afraid. It says that he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Verse 6, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Now, there's a reason for that. Saul had disobeyed the Lord. He was doing things that he shouldn't have been doing. He was, for really no good reason, he was trying to murder David. And he was consumed with hatred for David out of jealousy, possibly. Um, but he was definitely not where... He was in a place where the Lord could speak to him and where the Lord could get through to him. And in this moment where he feels like, okay, well, I'm going to try to trust the Lord, he, he says that he inquired of the Lord, but it says the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Well, at this point, Samuel the prophet, who was the main prophet, had died, and you know, the Urim was, a, was something that the, the, the priests in, in the temple um, used to, as kind of a, oh, a, you know, the Urim and Thummim was something that was part of the, the temple where it would give them some kind of insight as to what to do. Um, so all of these things that he thought he could rely upon, he was getting nothing. At this point, maybe Saul should have said, I'm not hearing from the Lord. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe, maybe it's me. Maybe I need to repent of something. Maybe I need to, you know, I need to fast. Maybe. So verse 7 says, Then Saul said to his servant, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So this is where he 
turns into a direction that is ultimately going to be the first step in his, in his downfall. Now, before we go any further, there's a scripture, and you, go, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it. In Deuteronomy, when Moses was telling the children of Israel, you know, before we go into the land, this, you know, he was giving them the, the instructions. And at a certain point, Moses knew he wasn't going to go into the land with them. And so he, it was, he was taking every opportunity to, to let them know. And as we covered not too long ago, um, Deuteronomy comes from Deuteronomos, which means a second telling of the law. And so here is the kind of the second time that Moses is telling them, these are the do's and don'ts when you go into the land. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting in verse 10, and this is directly related to this portion of scripture where Saul says, find me a medium. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 says, there shall not be found among you, and this is Moses speaking to the people, to the children of Israel, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them, them out before you. Now he was speaking of the, the pagan Canaanites who are already in the land. Verse 13, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you will dispossess Listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. And so that's how he did do things. He raised up prophets. Well, we're at a point back in 1 Samuel where Samuel the prophet had died. And so Saul now, in an act of, kind of an act of desperation, he says, because he was afraid. He was afraid of what was happening around him. He was seeing that his kingdom was in trouble. And so he seeks against the Lord's wishes and against the Lord's commandment. He seeks a medium. And so this is the the account of was referred to as the witch of Endor. Verse 8, back in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 8, it says, So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. So now he's disguising himself. He's using, he's not being honest. He's using some chicanery to, you know, because he knows that, well, wait a minute, aren't you the guy in charge? And don't you know that we're not supposed to do this? And so he goes to do this in disguise. So verse 8, it says again, and he went to the two men with, with, and went with, and the two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. So he's, he's completely, you know, going against what they were warned not to do. Verse 9, then the woman said to him, look, you, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? So this woman was probably not, um, she was probably somewhat of a, a good um, a person who was probably a, a good judge of character and probably not somebody who was easily um, tricked or manipulated. She knew that, they, that what they came to seek of her was forbidden. And some of the commentaries I've read say that they believe that she probably knew that this was Saul in disguise. And so she says, well, you know that this is not allowed. You know, I can't do this. And 
So she says, you know, why then do you lay a, a snare for my life to cause me to die? Verse 10, and Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for, upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, and maybe this woman thought, okay, well, this is Saul. He just told me that nothing's going to happen. So obviously he's not respecting the commandment. So I'm going to do what he's asking of me. Verse 11 says, when, then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. So this is kind of a, he's got some intestinal fortitude here. He's disobeying God. He's asking this woman to basically also be disobedient and do this thing. But then he wants to inquire of Samuel, who had died. And part of that commandment says, you know, don't consult with anybody who, who raises the dead. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this particular portion of Scripture, which I'm not going to really delve into. There's some people that say that, well, it, that the, the Lord allowed Samuel to really show up. Also, people think that it, it's also a, a demonic spirit posing as Saul. Um, and as I said, this is a very controversial subject. People have different beliefs about spirits and, and familiar spirits. And that um, this it was probably a, a demonic spirit that knew that uh, what was unfolding. So either way, the result is the same. But that's a whole other uh, topic of, that we could focus on and, and discuss. But in this instance, this um, woman, this uh, witch of Endor is bringing, um, is being obedient to Saul's wishes. Verse 12 says, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice and the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me for you are Saul? So like I said before, I think she may have probably thought it was him prior to but now she's kind of doing the, either she was truly surprised or she's doing kind of her, she's doing the act to kind of cover herself. But at this point, I think the, the cat's out of the bag. And Saul is there asking this, this woman who's a medium, um, who is acting in defiance of the Lord's wishes. But there she is, and as, as she said, you know, why, why have, you know, she says, you're Saul. And, you know, and then verse 13 says, and the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Verse 15, now Samuel said to Saul, like I said, there's controversy whether this is actually Samuel. But what was said was actually, um, is important because it makes it clear to Saul that what he's doing and, and this course of action is the wrong course of action. And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Now, this is an interesting portion of scripture because, you know, if you ask anybody, you know, who goes to fortune tellers or goes to, to do this kind of thing or you know, pays attention to astrology or tarot cards or any of those kind of things. They're trying to get information. They're trying to get intel so that they can make decisions for their life. But they're doing themselves a huge disservice by dismissing the fact that God could give them godly wisdom 
that would actually be the best wisdom that they could employ in their lives. And unfortunately, I think people still to this day do this kind of thing where they look to other, anything but God. They'll look anywhere else to try and get advice or information and whether it's, you know, self-help books or uh, philosophy or, um, you know, people who were great thinkers in history, you know, people will read and, and try and, and glean wisdom. Well, the secret is really not a secret. It's like, it's all right here. You know, the wisdom of God is, it's not only there for the taking or for the asking, but this word is alive. It lives, it moves, it, it, it speaks differently to everyone who inquires. And so Saul is really missing the boat here with regards to trying to find some sort of, of instruction as to what to do. And verse 16 says, Then Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? Verse 17, And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, namely David. So this wasn't untrue. This was a true statement. Now, was it spoken truly by the ghost of, of Samuel? Or, or even if it was a, a, a demonic spirit that was disguised as Samuel, it kind of doesn't really matter because the point was made to, Sa to Saul that, you know, this is not the right course of action. And because of this, this is why the kingdom is going to be torn out of your hand. Getting back to the beginning of this study, we we're talking about the reason why David came to, came to power and the reason why David was anointed as king was because we had this example of this king, Saul, who started out great and he, you know, he was, by all accounts, he was tall, he was handsome, he looked the part. Um, the people thought he was great. They loved him. But he was, he had some moral shortcomings. And so at this point, he's afraid. Saul is afraid. And he just got a kind of a bad confirmation as to, you know, where he's at and what he's trying to do. Verse 18, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute, his, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Now, Amalek, if you remember, the first big thing that, Sam, that Saul did that really defied what the Lord wanted him to do was he was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Well, and you know um, from the account in a few chapters prior to this in 1 Samuel um, where Samuel didn't destroy the Amalekites. He thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, you know, the king, King Agag, and I'm going to, you know, keep all the livestock. And Samuel shows up and says, you know, wh why do I hear the livestock in the background? You should have slayed. You were told to utterly destroy. And Amalek is a kind of a, a metaphor for, for sin. There was, you know, he had a tendency for sin and he didn't put it to death. He didn't destroy it. It ended up staying in his life and it ended up festering and it ended up becoming something that was going to ultimately lead to his downfall. And as he's doing the, the very thing, inquiring of a, of a forbidden medium, the very spirit that he was trying to conjure up is, is telling, basically telling him that, he's, that his doom is certain and brings up the, the fact that because he was disobedient even as far back as this 
account with the Amalekites. He says, therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Verse 19, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. He's in a bad way, and he's now, he's even more afraid. Now when we seek the Lord for guidance, the fruit of that is, is not, definitely not fear. It's the opposite of that. Something that, call, that we call Peace, that peace that passes understanding. People seek, you know, Christians who are seeking the Lord, and even in the direst of, of circumstances, and we can still have peace. And you know what? Honestly, I don't understand it either. Sometimes we go through things and we go, I don't know why, but I have peace. Things look really bad, but I'm just trusting the Lord and I have peace. This is definitely not where Saul was at. And so back in 1 Chronicles, I promise we're actually in Chronicles, we see this whole thing in a very synoptic way being, being spoken of here in, in Chronicles. And now that we kind of see the, de- the kind of the detail in the background of, what, of what's playing out as this is being spoken of, Verse 4 says, Then Saul said to his armor bearer, now we're back in the, this, this part where the, the battle is happening. Actually, it's back up to verse 3. It says, The battle became intense against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded by the archers. So the battle became intense. And what happened to, to Saul? How did he become so vulnerable to the enemy? Well, he became vulnerable to the enemy because... He was trying to find protection that wasn't good protection. Now, we just spoke about the weapons, the physical weapons. Now, if you have a shield that's made out of steel, when the archers shoot their arrows, they're going to deflect off the shield. If you have a shield that's made out of tin or aluminum or something that's very not very strong, Um, those arrows are going to go right through the shield. And if you don't even have a shield, the arrows are going to probably hit you. And in this instance, that's exactly what happens. Those arrows are hitting. And it's interesting in Ephesians, you know, the famous chapter in Ephesians chapter 6 about the implements of war and how they're equated to spiritual attributes that we should employ. Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, talking about the implements of war. Now, this is a practical application of the implements of war. And in Ephesians, of course, it's, it's practical, but it's, it's spiritual and it's practical. But it says in Ephesians 6.16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, a fiery dart, it's kind of like an arrow. And maybe those arrows that the Philistines shot at Saul, maybe they weren't flaming arrows, but they still did a lot of damage. He didn't have this shield of faith. Literally and metaphorically, he didn't, he wasn't putting his faith where it should have been. And so he fell prey to these very arrows that were being shot by the enemy. And so it says here in verse 4, Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Again, there's fear. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. A very... A very uh, unfortunate ending for Saul, for somebody who was a king, somebody who, you know, he was, 
trying to die with honor, and I would say this is probably one of the most dishonorable ways that you could go out. Verse 5, and, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died. And it's an interesting illustration that you know, leadership counts. And if this guy was afraid of, you know, he was greatly afraid, what are all his men thinking? What are, what are his sons thinking? What is everyone thinking? This is our leader, and he's running scared. Do you think that inspired courageous men to be even more courageous? Or did it make them all afraid? I would say it probably made all of them afraid. Verse 7, And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that they had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled. Then the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So they basically literally gave up ground to the enemy because of their fear. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, fear is a valuable and very useful tool in the hands of the enemy. You know, there's a lot of things that we can be afraid of. And there's a lot of reasoned arguments that can tell you why you should be afraid of certain things. And sometimes, I mean, I can't explain it and I don't understand it exactly. But sometimes there's just things that I, I, I say, well, I'm not going to live in fear. You know, I'm, I'm going to live and I'm going to go forward and I'm going to trust the Lord that the Lord's going to do something or he's going to make a way. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us that the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So Saul definitely was not trusting the Lord. And his fear ended up being one of the major things that ended up bringing his ultimate downfall. Verse 8, So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among the people. You know, the enemy's always wanting to make us a trophy. He's always trying to take us down. He would love nothing more than to figuratively, you know, take our spiritual likeness of that, you know, the very head. In this case, you know, Saul was the king. Um, it was a kind of a, a very cruel custom that if you, you slew someone who was very important, how could everybody know that you've got the main guy? They'd take his head off, and they'd, they'd put it on a pike, and they'd, they'd you know, put it out for everybody to see. And in this case, they're doing it in the, in the temple of their idols, their pagan gods. And now it reminds me of, you remember the account of Belshazzar's feast, where he took all the implements of the temple that they had taken from the Israelites and they were making a mockery of, of the God of Israel. And Belshazzar was having his drunken feast with the implements of the temple. And that's when the Lord showed up and the handwriting on the wall. Telling him, you know, your time is done. You know, you've been, you've been weighed and been found wanting. And Daniel had to come and explain to them, you know, it's, sorry to tell you this, but it's, you're done, dude. It's over. Now, it's, a, it's an awesome thing for us as believers to see how the hand of God, the very hand of God, would show up and, and, and set things aright. In this instance, the hand of God had to come in and set things aright as far as the kingship of the nation of Israel. And as the spirit of Samuel had to remind Saul just before he fell prey to, you know, to the enemy, that this is why the kingdom is being taken away from you. 
Verse 10, then they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head on the temple of Dagon. So Dagon was their god. And, and you know, you remember that Dagon was the god that when they, the, the Philistines had captured the, the Ark of the Covenant, they put it in the temple of Dagon. And the, t- the idol of Dagon fell over and was basically bowing to the Ark of the Covenant. And they kept trying to figure out, why does this thing keep falling over? Well, it was falling over because it was falling in reverence to the, the presence of the, of the actual true and living God. But this is the same Dagon. Verse 11, And when all Jabesh Gilead heard that the, Phil, what the, that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons, and they brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. <clears throat> so after all this plays out, you, you see that the, you know, the nation is, is in turmoil. They took Saul, they took his armor, and they mocked him. Um, they... They were showcasing his armor and his, his actual head in their temple. And even though the nation was gripped with fear, there were still righteous men. There was still a remnant. And as it says here, that when the men of Jabesh Gilead heard what happened to Saul... Verse 12 says, all the valiant men arose and took the body of Saul. So they went and they said, this isn't right. We need to do the right thing. They had no control over what had happened and the the wheels, they were already in motion. But there were still righteous men, valiant men. And we hear that word a lot, but valiant means possessing or acting with bravery or boldness, courage and determination. These guys were determined to do the right thing. And God always has a remnant of of those who are willing to do the right thing. And so it says that they took the remains and they buried them and they, they did the proper thing. And it says that they fasted for seven days in reverence. Verse 13, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Now, the book of Chronicles doesn't always delve into a lot of detail, and that's why we kind of went into a lot of detail with regards to this whole passage. But I think in short, what we see is that Saul, just like the, the handwriting on the wall of Belshazzar's feast, you know, that many mene tekel, which is translated as, you have been weighed and have been found wanting. And here's an instance where Saul had been weighed and he had been found wanting. He fell short. But it wasn't because of circumstances beyond his control. It was because of the choices that he made. And he made some bad choices. Verse 14 at the end of this chapter 10 just says, but he did not inquire of the Lord. That's where he messed up. That's where he, he took a, the wrong turn. He should have continued to inquire of the Lord. And if he wasn't hearing from the Lord, he should have said, Lord, I'm not hearing from you. You know, why? You know, maybe that was a good time for some introspection to say, okay, Lord, why am I not hearing from you? Hmm, is it because I'm trying to kill David? Is it because I'm allowing a lot of evil things to continue to happen? Um, I, I truly believe that if, if Saul would have said, you know, in all sincerity to the Lord, I'm not hearing from you, Lord, why? You know, what did I do? Is it me? But he didn't ever say that. And so as things played out, they played out the way that God intended them for for things to play out. And we see that this leads to 
the kingdom being turned over to David, the son of Jesse. And we know that David wasn't a perfect guy, and he made some bad choices too. But we also know that he was a man after God's own heart, and we know by reading some of the Psalms that David did seek after the Lord, and he did have repentance, and he did want to make himself right with God. It didn't mean that he wasn't going to make some bad choices because we know he did. But I think it gives encouragement to all of us that, you know, there's times in our lives where we come up against fear or we come up against obstacles or we have things occurring in our lives and you, we know that the place to turn is to turn to the Lord. <clears throat> and I want to end with, with uh, the account in, in, uh, in the Gospels. You don't have to turn there. But where the Lord is speaking to the, the people and he's telling them about the Lord's Supper and he's just referring to himself that it's if you eat his body and drink his blood. Now he didn't mean physical cannibalism, but the people didn't understand. They didn't get it. And so the disciples were there and the disciples were kind of watching and so Jesus realizes that some people kind of left like, okay, this is gross. This guy this guy's talking gibberish and they they you know they left. And so Jesus says to, to Peter, he says, you know, people have left. Are you going to leave too? And he said, where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. <clears throat> and I think for us as Christians, it's a simple choice. There's nowhere else to go. We know that that's the best place to go. and We know that's where we're going to get the best wisdom and the best advice that we could get. But we also know that the Lord didn't give us a spirit of fear. And so, learn from the, the mistakes of those that came before us and, and see that Saul made some mistakes and I'm pretty sure all of these people who were used by the Lord, they made their mistakes. But the Lord continued to use them. And Samuel... Um, he laid out this scenario where, you know, he was not for Saul being king, but the Lord said, you know, Saul's going to be king. You know, the people want a king, they're going to get the king. And we knew what would happen by reading this. The people didn't know what would happen, but, you know, Saul didn't have a great end. <clears throat> and it was because he didn't trust the Lord. So now as we get into chapter 11... Next week, we'll see the beginning of, uh, of King David and his kingship. So, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Lord, just giving us the, the ability to take a look at the things that Saul did and the, the ways that he, he didn't trust in you, Lord, and... Um, and I know, Lord, that you are long-suffering and that you don't want anyone to perish, but you also give us free will. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to use our free will wisely, Lord, to choose to seek after you, to seek you in those times of trouble, in those times when maybe we, <clears throat> we are a little afraid, but that we would rely on you, Lord, and, and turn those things over to you and trust in you wholeheartedly and completely. So we thank you, Lord, we praise you, and you just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.